Hi, my name is Agnes Callard, and I'm going to talk to you about um, an article of mine called Being Good at Being Bad that uh, just came out in the new Cambridge Companion to Plato. I think it was published maybe in August, something like that. Um, so the subtitle is uh, Plato's Hippias Minor, and that's what the uh, article is about. So the Hippias Minor argues that... Uh, good people are the people who are also good at being bad. So if you imagine an expert archer, the expert archer can ensure that their arrow hits the bullseye, but they're also good at making sure that their arrow misses the target entirely if that's what they wanted to do. If you were a bad archer, you might accidentally hit the bullseye when you wanted to miss the target. And uh, Aristotle takes, sorry, Socrates takes this model of um, the expert is good at breaking the rules of the relevant domain and he applies it to justice as well. So he says, the expert in justice, the just man, is also the one who can make sure that he does something unjust. He draws a really shocking conclusion, which is that if anyone deliberately does what's unjust, it's the just person. So the just person is the one who knows how to be unjust. Okay. So um, it's hard to know what to make of this shocking claim that good people are the ones who can do bad things, uh, the only ones who can do bad things. Uh, and it has been... Uh, interpreted in a variety of ways, including as being ironic, uh, and uh, also diffused in a variety of ways as being not as shocking as you think. I think it can be diffused, but before we get to that, I just want to kind of go through Socrates' argument. All right, so um, the basic, the, the, the first the dialogue is short, it's in two parts, uh, and there's some repetition between the two parts, but the first part of the argument uh, is about lying. And uh, Socrates is arguing that the person who will be good at lying in a given domain is going to be the one who can, who is also good at saying the truth in that domain. So. If you want to make sure that you're going to say something false in geometry, then you know you should consult a geometer. The geometer will be good at making sure that they say something false, because somebody that has, uh, you know, doesn't have geometrical knowledge, they might try to say something false but end up saying something true, and so too in every area. In every area, the um, the person who will be good at lying in that area is also the person who's going to be good at uh, telling the truth in that area. Now, after Socrates makes this argument, his interlocutor Hippias says, no, I, you know, I, I think it applies in the case of geometry uh, and mathematical truths, but it doesn't apply when we're talking about like the moral case of a liar and a truth teller and they're comparing Achilles and Odysseus and Hippias wants to say Achilles when he lies he just lies accidentally involuntarily because he didn't know that what he was saying was false whereas Odysseus intentionally uh, lies and he deceives and so Odysseus is worse than Achilles so maybe the, in geometry the person who lies on purpose um, who's able to lie on purpose would be the better at geometry, but it's not true that Odysseus is better than Ach that Achilles. Achilles is better than Odysseus. Um, the involuntary liar is better than the voluntary liar. And Socrates is like, nope, it's true in the case of Achilles and Odysseus too. People who do things wrong on purpose, those are the better people. And Hippias says that that seems nuts. That just doesn't doesn't seem intuitively true. And Socrates admits it's a little counterintuitive, but he then says, okay, let's not just talk about lying, let's talk more generally about all kinds of cases where someone can do something well or badly. So he lists, you know, which one is the better runner? The run who runs, the one who runs slowly voluntarily or the 
one who runs slowly involuntarily. Well, it's going to be the run, one who runs slowly voluntarily. That is, if I could choose to run slowly, then I must be better at running than if I'm forced to run slowly by my inability to run. In wrestling, too, the one who voluntarily uh, messes up is the one who's better. Um, in general, a physically better person um, the, 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 the pers- is the person who is able to, um, uh, to screw up in the physical domain. Um, uh, he even says, you know, with ears and nose and mouth, uh, when your sense organs involuntarily accomplish bad results, that means those sense organs are bad. Whereas if I'm choosing to make my eyes see badly, like by, um, I can, I can like squish them and then they'll see badly. And then that's a sign that my eyes are in better shape than if they see badly involuntarily. Uh, and he even ex- extends it to horses. You'd rather have a horse with such a soul that one could ride it badly voluntarily rather than involuntarily. Okay. Um, so what Socrates, um, seems to be saying is there's a very very general point here to be made about norms that if you um somebody who is whose behavior fails to conform to a norm uh by their own choice or voluntarily that person we can say is flouting the norm they're choosing to disobey the norm Whereas somebody whose behavior fails to conform to the norm um, involuntarily, they'd like it to conform, but it doesn't, we can say that they're flubbing the norm. And he's saying that flouters in any area are better at the relevant activity than flubbers. And because flouting the norm is actually, the capacity to flout the norm is actually a sign of excellence in respect to that very norm. And that this is just a general point about all norms. And so it's going to apply to moral norms too. Uh, So Socrates says, the more powerful and better soul, when it does injustice, will do injustice voluntarily. Only the worthless soul will do it involuntarily. The one who voluntarily misses the mark and does what's shameful and unjust. If there is such a person, that would be none other than the good man. Okay, so... Socrates is saying this isn't just a point about lying and telling the truth. It's that's just a special case of a general um, fact about norms, which is that if you are good at the activity governed by the norm, then when your behavior fails to conform that norm, you'll be flouting it, and that flouting will be a sign of your mastery. Um, All right, but what are we to make of the claim that the good man is the one who will do injustice? Um, Does Socrates seriously think that good people do unjust things? And no, it doesn't doesn't seem like he thinks that. In fact, in other dialogues, he says nobody willingly does injustice. Um, And uh, so, you know, one way you can temper the conclusion of the Hippias Minor is to point out that all Socrates says is that if anyone does injustice voluntarily, it will be the just man. And he doesn't say that anyone does injustice voluntarily. Uh, so you might think what Socrates actually thinks is that only the just man has the capacity to do injustice, but he won't exercise it because Socrates thinks everyone desires the good. The just man desires to do what's good. He knows how to do what's bad. He has the power, but he, he's going to refuse to exercise it. And so Socrates isn't saying that good people actually do bad things. He's saying only good people could do bad things. All right. Uh, And some people have said this is actually the point of the hippies. Minor is to show that, like, nobody does bad things voluntarily. Uh, I think this way of tempering the conclusion and of rescuing Socrates from immoralism is roughly correct. Um, Socrates does think that no one will do, uh, intentionally do unjust things. Um, only the just person could, but the just person won't because they're, um, like everyone else, they desire the good and unlike many other people, they know how to achieve it. So they will actually achieve it. 
But that's not the point of the hippiest minor. The point of the hippiest minor is not to say nobody does bad things. The point of the hippiest minor is to say if anyone were to do bad things, it would be the, the, the good person. So we still have to explain why Socrates wants to make that claim. And um, I think that the, uh, to sort of see the, the force of the claim he's making as a general claim about normativity here, it's going to be helpful too. I made you got a little chart here. Okay. Um, so you might have thought that when there's a norm, the important thing is, does the person conform to the norm or do they violate the norm? Right. So does their behavior accord with the norm or not? And, you know, people on this side are people who conform to the norm and people on this side are people who violate the norm. Um, what the hippiest minor argues is that actually that's not that important. It doesn't much matter whether your behavior accords with the norm or violates it. What really matters is how the behavior accords or violates with the norm. And there's two ways. You can do it as with power or with, uh, sorry, without power or with power. Okay, so the powerless person, when their behavior conforms to the norm, when, when, when the person who's powerless at archery, when they hit a bullseye, it's just by accident. So what caused the bullseye is chance. And when their uh, arrow misses the target, that's also by chance. So the powerless person's behavior conforms or violates the norm just by chance. But the powerful person, the person with the relevant skill, is the person who, when their behavior conforms to the norm, it's because they wanted it to. Their actions are governed by or dictated by desire. Whereas the powerless person, sorry, the power, the power, the powerful person, it's very hard to point to this chart because everything is backwards. The powerful person, um, when their behavior violates the norm, it's because they wanted it to violate the norm, so they are flouting the norm. And so Socrates is saying that the columns in this chart are less important than the rows. And you want to be the kind of person who is powerful. You shouldn't care whether your behavior conforms or violates the norm. You should care whether which way it does it. And power is then going to be... Uh, uh, lined up with virtue or being good at whatever the thing is. It could be being good at uh, archery. It could be being good at justice. Um, okay. So um, you might you might have asked, well, what's the importance of having this chart if um, you know part of it uh, in the case of justice over here, the uh, desire based nonconformity, you're not gonna have any instances of that, right? So a person who has the craft, uh, who knows how to be just, is never gonna violate the norms of justice. They could, they're the people who could, if anyone could, but they won't. So the, the, there, won't, there won't be any behavior like this when it comes to justice. There might be when it comes to archery, there might be when it comes to running, right? I might intentionally run slowly, I might intentionally lose at chess, but I wouldn't intentionally lose at justice if I had the norm. So this this will this this um, box will never be occupied in the case of justice. But nonetheless, Socrates wants to say, in principle, in, like it, theoretically, if we abstract from the fact that the just person desires the good, it could be. Um, and uh, the reason why Socrates wants to talk in that way is because he wants to say that what's really important is the power. The easiest way to see the force of that point is to compare it with um, the philosopher who sort of disagrees exactly on this point, which is Aristotle. So um, Socrates is saying that what's important is, in, 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 in respect of, say, virtue, is whether you have the virtue in your soul, whether you have the power, the capacity, the ability. So virtue is a state of your soul. and the actions that spring from it um, are less important than the virtue that you have. Because in fact, the very same action, let's say hitting the target or you know, doing the just thing, could have been caused by, accidentally, by the lack of that state in your soul, just by chance. So what's valuable isn't the actions, what's valuable is the power, the state of your soul. 
And so uh, Socrates is a virtue ethicist in the sense that he thinks that what's important is having virtue, the condition of your soul, not what you do with it, not what you use it for, not its external manifestations, because its external manifestations can um, be the same as the external manifestations of chance. Aristotle disagrees. He thinks he is not a virtue ethicist, I would say. He's a virtue activation ethicist. So Aristotle thinks that what's important is what you do with your virtue, the use you make of your virtue, the actions that you perform by means of your virtue. But then how does he deal with this Socratic objection that you, those actions, those same actions could be performed by somebody who didn't have the virtue? Um, so, you know, if I return a deposit to you because I'm a just person, how could the valuable thing be the returning of the deposit when someone else who just returns the deposit by chance? Uh, Aristotle's answer is that when you return the deposit by chance, that's not a just action. That is, Aristotle thinks that the state of your soul is like imbued and contained in some way in the action so that we don't say that the very same action, um, namely returning the deposit, could be done in two different ways, by chance and by justice. Instead, we say, no, there's two different actions. We call, they might look similar, but we call them by different names depending on whether or not they're caused by the state in someone's soul, virtue, or just by chance. And um, one of the examples Aristotle gives sort of in response to the hippias minor is he says, you know, well, Socrates seems to think that you could, um, uh, you know, you could have a leg that works badly voluntarily and then you're flouting the norm of work of walking well by limping, or you could have a leg that works b badly involuntarily, um, where then you would like to walk well, right? But you're flubbing the norm because you're you're limping, uh, even though you would like not to be limp limping. So on the Socratic view, there's sort of two ways you might limp: by flouting the norm or by flubbing the norm of walking well. So Aristotle says. No, when you're flouting the norm of walking well by intentionally um, limping, even though you could walk well, you're mimicking a limp. You're not really limping. So we give that outer activity of, you know, walking in such a way that walking in this uneven way, we give it two different names depending on whether it's caused by desire uh, and virtue or by chance. Uh, so I think what is so interesting about the Hippias Minor is that it illustrates this point at which sort of virtue ethics diverges, right? And you have the Socratic option, which is that what's valuable is the state of your soul. And then later you're going to get this Aristotelian alternative, which is that what, what's valuable can be the outer action if the outer action can be classified di differentially on the basis of what causes it. Thanks.